name before you spoke it to be. You were the King of Kings. Yeah, you were. Yeah, you were. And now you're reigning still, enthroned above all things. Angels and saints cry out. We join them as we sing. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God forever. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God forever. Take a moment and say hello.
song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God From my mother's womb You have chosen me Love has called my name I've been born again Into your family Your blood flows through my veins I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child I'm no longer a slave to fear Yes, I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God Child of 
of God I'm no longer a slave to fear Yes, I am a child of God Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for bringing us here. We thank you, God for these songs. And God, most importantly, we are so thankful for you and the love that you show us every single day. God, that we can have a relationship with the creator of the universe. And that itself is so amazing. And Father, I just pray for this service. I pray for this time that we get to open your word and hear from your word. God, that you would just speak to us. God, that you would open our hearts, open our ears. Just try not to let any distraction of, of what's going on in our life pull us away from what you're trying to tell us today. And Father, we love you, and we thank you so much for everything that you're doing in our lives, in this church. And it's your beautiful name that we pray. Amen. We need to go right to work today. We got a lot of verses to cover. I happen to know there are some new people here today, and I can't review everything for you, but I'd like to review enough so you can understand why this true story is told today. We're studying Mark's gospel. Gospel means good news. It's the good news of God that his son has come to earth to save us. If Jesus Christ is going to do everything that the Old Testament predicted he would do, he is going to have to have the power to do it. In this section, it's showing us his power. I mean, if he is going to conquer sin, if he is going to conquer Satan and demons, if he is going to conquer death, if he is going to raise his people from the dead, if he is going to recreate a new earth that's going to have tame animals on it and tame people on it, he's going to have to have some incredible power. In this section of Mark's gospel, we're getting a glimpse of the power of Jesus Christ. We saw Jesus out on the water, and he speaks to the wind and the waves and he calms a storm with hurricane force. Last week, we saw a man who had gone crazy. He was filled with demons. And Jesus Christ proved his power over the demonic supernatural world as he cast the demons out. And the crazy man says he was dressed and in his right mind. He went from crazy to calm. In our story today, it really, it shows Jesus' power over disease and his power over death. Um, that's the main point. That's the main point of this story. Jesus Christ has power over disease and he has power over death. And when he comes again, he will eliminate it. But we also see in this story something that we need to see. With all this incredible power that Jesus has, he is so compassionate. So compassionate. It's very hard in this world and throughout history to see somebody with power who is a compassionate person. <laughs> Jesus had unlimited power and unlimited compassion. Also, I think we see some application in our life. We see application that if you are in despair, Jesus Christ can give you hope. Jesus Christ can give you hope. There's two people in this story. 
stories are tied together. I probably should have made two sermons out of it, but it goes together, so we're going to get through it today. One person is a religious bigwig. He's an important person in this town. The other person is a nobody. It's, we don't even get her name. It's just a woman. She's an outcast of society. Both of these people are desperate. They're in despair, and it's made them desperate. When life makes you desperate, Sometimes you're in a good place because that'll make you make changes in your life, good changes. Sometimes when you get desperate, you'll do bad things, things you never were taught to do, things you never thought you would do, and you can go the other way. These people were desperate, and they went to the best place they could possibly go, to the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's look at the story. Mark chapter 5, we left off at verse 21 last week. And it says, And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. And then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. Now in Luke's gospel, when he tells this story, he starts out by saying, behold, exclamation point. Like, this is shocking. Watch this. What's so shocking about this? Because this was a ruler of the synagogue. This was a very important man in Capernaum. He was like the pastor of the synagogue, the administrator of the synagogue, all of, all of the above. But the surprising thing was is to say that the religious establishment in Israel hated Jesus, that was an understatement. They were absolutely at odds against him. And so this Jairus, you got to understand, is risking his reputation. It's very possible that Jairus was in on the badgering of Jesus at first. But things have changed in his life. And he's he's always been able to fix things before, and now he can't. And so he comes, he's desperate, and he comes to Jesus. And even though he's part of the religious establishment that have attacked Jesus, we saw in Mark chapter 2, their goal was to destroy Jesus. And by the end, and Jesus knew this, we see their real heart. They want to murder Jesus. And you would think, Jesus, would this man come and all these guys were against him? You know, what, what would we have done? Would you be so willing to show compassionate on a man that's been your enemy and forgiveness? But this is our Savior. He has compassion and forgiveness towards Jairus. Because Jairus comes and he he falls at Jesus' feet. And I want you to know if you're here today, understand That's the only way to approach Jesus. Now, I want to say, not just his knees were bowing before Jesus, his heart was bowing before Jesus. You need to understand that, because there's many people in this world today that will get on their knees to their God. And maybe it's just small g, but it's not in their heart to be desperate for God's mercy and love and help. We're going to see the rich young ruler uh, later on in Mark's gospel. He falls down on his knees, but it was all superficial. It was all religious mumbo jumbo. He didn't love Christ in his heart, and Christ exposed that. So make sure you understand what I'm saying. Make sure your heart bows before Jesus Christ, and you come to him 
humbly. And if you do that, church will become more than an intellectual analyzing kind of thing, like it's a classroom where you're learning about Jesus. And you will encounter how real and personal he is. Let's read on in the story. Verse 25. Now understand, now they're on their way to Jairus' house. And you know Jairus is like, let's get going here, right? (laughs) But there's a setback. Verse 25. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years, who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. You guys know Mark loves that word immediately. Jesus is so much different than the faith faith healers of today with all this mumbo jumbo and hocus pocus. When somebody gets healed and he wants them healed immediately it happens now we don't know exactly what this woman's problem is we can only speculate Um, like last week in last week I tell you sometimes in your Bible study you get confused and you have questions about things that don't matter it doesn't matter exactly what was going on with this woman. The, the, the point is, she had a problem, and she was desperate, and Jesus fixed the problem. That's the point. She was having some kind of discharge of blood that was beyond what any other normal woman had, and she was battling it for 12 years. So whatever this discharge was, whatever was going on, In her body, it wasn't enough to kill her, but it was just a matter of time. And it's no doubt she was probably anemic, probably weak, coming to the end. And she heard about Jesus, and she had faith that he could cure her. What was worse about this woman's health was what this did to her socially. You see, in the Jewish culture, and even in the Old Testament, and I really shouldn't even go here today with this because this gets off, but I got to, this is so important. If it's not important, I won't do it, but it's important. The Old Testament, God, in the Levitical law, when a woman had a discharge of blood and her monthly cycle, she was considered unclean for a week. Now, people in modern day read that, and then skeptics who hate the Bible and hate us Christians, how can you uh, worship a God who's had all these crazy laws? And you got to understand, God is a genius. And all of God's laws, if you take the time to study it and you examine it and don't just listen to the the skeptics that might be feeding your doubt, that God had purpose in all of these laws. And I told you before, uh, when we talked about the dietary laws, God was preserving his people. And because of the blood flow and because they did not have hygiene products, they did not have hand sanitizer, they did not even have soap and water, a discharge of blood that would get on the bed and, and, and it could become a problem and because it wasn't sanitary, it could cause a serious infection and disease and it could become so bad it could eliminate the people of Israel. God was protecting them. This was a hygienic thing. It was causing them to be clean constantly, made sure they didn't touch anything that would hurt them, that would disease them. 
My little grandson was in the NCIU. We went in there and we had to wash like for, I forget how long it was. And I was like, man, this is kind of overdoing it, isn't it? But I did it. Why should I be mad at the hospital? They're just trying to protect the babies from disease. This is what God was doing. God was protecting them with all these laws that we don't understand in our modern day. In our modern day, it's not a problem. In our modern day, this woman probably have a hysterectomy. But in this day, it was a problem. And because God made this bleeding unclean, nobody but wanted to be around her. Nobody wanted to touch her. And instead of, and what had happened is, the religious establishment got so corrupt, instead of the priest helping the woman, instead of them maybe quarantining her and trying to help her, make sure she was cleansed, make sure anybody else that had been around her would be cleansed so they could take care of her needs and still help her, instead of doing that, you know what they did? They, she was an outcast. You're done. You're out of here. And nobody wanted anything to do with her. And she did not have no husband. I, I can bet you on that one. And it's possible even her own family would not be around her. That was the worst part of this. And, and, and this woman was absolutely desperate for someone to help her in her extreme pain. We've seen in the Gospels, these are the kind of people Jesus loves to help. Jesus, yeah, both of them, one's a big wig, religious guy, one's a nobody, but we did see he was drawn to the nobodies most of the time. They were the ones that needed him. They were the ones that wanted him. You, you come to church and you feel like you're an outcast, you don't feel in, fit in, listen, no, you're the one God wants to help. The, the sophisticated person that comes in here and thinks they're better than everybody else, there's a wall up between them and God. But you who feel like you're an outcast, you've made mistakes, oh, God wants to help you today. God wants to wrap his arms around you. We saw in Mark 2, Jesus said, hey, it's, it, it's the sick that need a doctor. We come here because we need a doctor. We're a hospital for sinners. We're in desperate need of salvation and help. Anything other than that, it's religiosity. So, you know, you go to a doctor's office, you go there for help, right? You're going to go sit in a doctor's office for no reason, not get help? You just go in the waiting room, just sitting there. Secretary's like, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just reading the magazines. I just like to come here and read the magazines. That's like how some of we are in church. Ah, oh, we come here. I just like to read the story. I like the story. I like this pastor. He tells some good stories, tells some jokes, you know. Is that what you do? No. They're going to be like, no, this is a, the doctor's office is going to go, this is a place for a sick. Why do you want to go to the doctor's office and read the magazines that the sick people have been reading, you know, deal, flipping through the pages? You come to Jesus Christ so he can heal your sickness. And this is a picture. Listen, we are all unclean. We, we are all unclean before God. And the point is, <clears throat> spiritually speaking, only Jesus Christ on that cross can make us clean. That's why sometimes when it talks about the blood of Jesus, it doesn't just say forgive sins. It says the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin and all our uncleanness. And immediately Jesus cures this woman. Now watch. Jesus likes to make it personal. He just doesn't want it to be some kind of miracle where she touches his clothes, and that's it. Because then everybody will be trying to look for Jesus' outfit. That's what people do. You try to find Jesus' outfit. If I could just find Jesus' outfit, Jesus fixes all that. Watch this, verse 30. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? We, we, we know Luke's gospel. This is Peter. This is our buddy Peter. Always open his mouth. 
Jesus, everybody's been touching you. They're bouncing all over you. And you want to know who's touched you? He's just so silly. You know, if this story was a made-up story, you'd never throw that in there about the bonehead disciples. <laughs> but it's just, it's just truth. But Jesus knew what they didn't know. He felt the supernatural power go out of him. It's possible he knew it was coming. And he said, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Now, who touched who? It's kind of confusing when you read this. We know Jesus is fully God. We know Jesus is fully man. Some scholars believe, they, they take the side that, well, since Jesus was fully man and sometimes he took on limitations of his knowledge, we know that, because Jesus says when he's talking about the end times, no one knows the hour of his return, not even the son, but only the father. And that was in his humanness. Now that he's sitting at the right hand of God on the throne, Trust me, he knows when he's coming. But as a man, he would take on limitations. So possibly, scholars think God the Father healed her because of her faith. And then Jesus in his humanness said, who touched me? So then he could deal with it. Other scholars, and I lean to this. I just think Jesus often, he often asked questions not for information, but to see where people were at and to bring out their faith to bring out their repentance, to bring out their trust in him. When Adam and Eve sinned and they're hiding in the woods and God comes out there and says, hey, where are you? He knew right where they were. He was trying to get them to come back to him and repent of what they had done. That's what God does. So that's what I think why he said, who touched me? So he could deal with her personally. So he, she could understand what happened to her. And she comes in fear and trembling. And again, this is how you come. You come in humility. You come in fear and trembling. And I don't know, maybe part of it, she thought she was going to get in trouble. She was an outcast with a flow of blood problem. She wasn't supposed to be touching anybody. And now you're trying to touch the creator of the universe? You're going to get in trouble for that? What did she get in trouble? Jesus said, Daughter daughter. I love this. You know, it's the only time he called somebody daughter. And guess who's listening? Jairus, who's got a daughter that's dying at home. And he says, daughter, you're my daughter. I'm not mad at you. You're my daughter. You have faith in me. And he said, your trust has saved you. Your faith has saved you. You know what he was saying? My outfit didn't save you. It wasn't magic. It was your faith in me, my person, that saved you. There's a lot of religious magic that goes on in our world today, folks, and it will not save you, help you in any way. The only help you will get from God is when you personally go to him and trust him. She wasn't cured by the touch. She was cured by her trust she came in pain and she left in peace maybe that's you today maybe you come in pain when I first got into the church I mean I was in pain I was in pain in here emptiness but Jesus Christ touched me spiritually and I left in peace and that can be you today God is dealing with your heart. So let's read on. Verse 35. We forgot about our buddy Jairus, who's desperate for help. And it says, verse 35, while he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? 
Enough of this Jesus stuff, Jairus. Your daughter has died. We got a funeral to deal with. Verse 36, but overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. I love that. I'll tell you, that can help you through a bad day right there. Do not fear, only believe. Great lesson here to learn. Jairus risks everything to come and trust Jesus Christ. But he didn't get his prayer answered right away, did he? He come and he said, my daughter is dying. And, and he knew that Jesus, if Jesus could get there, he could save her. But he didn't, he knew that if she died, that was too late. And on the way to the house, Jesus is dealing with people in the crowd. He's dealing with this woman who's an outcast in society. When he could be going to important Jairus' house. And it's taken a lot of time. And I don't know what Jairus is thinking. Maybe he just, he was humbled and he just was following Jesus and had to trust him. Maybe he was frustrated. Have you ever been frustrated with God? When you've done everything you're supposed to do and you pray, but your prayer doesn't seem to get answered right away? And it seems to take forever? And it, and it seems that there's obstacles in the way? This is such a great lesson to learn. When life gets that way for you and you're in despair and you've prayed and it seems like it's taking forever for your prayer to be answered and crazy obstacles are in the way, do not fear, only believe. Do not fear, only believe. Jairus' problem had gone from difficult to impossible. And it was a good place to be because, like I said, in Jairus' life, he was one of these guys that could always fix everything himself. He could take everything himself. Any other crisis he faced, he dealt with it himself. But this was a crisis beyond what he could fix, and he was in a good place. Some of you, that brought you to Christ. You got in a situation, you just couldn't fix it. My situation, I didn't have anybody dying. I didn't have a disease. I wasn't sick, but I was sick and tired. Sick and tired. And it made me desperate for something else. Sometimes that is what will bring you to Jesus. So Jairus is in a good place. And I really believe that when you go through a crisis and you see how real God is and when you do pray to him and when you do trust him, you find out Jesus Christ is a savior and a friend. That's what Mike, Mark's gospel is telling us. He's, he's your savior and he's your friend. He's your God that needs to be worshiped. He's holy. But he also wants to be your savior and your friend and church will no longer be a classroom where you come to learn. Christ will be your savior and friend in your everyday life. And the Bible will come alive to you. So you need to get that. Do not fear and only believe. And you need to, you need to write that on an index card. Okay? You need to take it with you if you're in despair. And if God is waiting a long time to answer your prayer, you need to get that in your mind and you need to believe it. I've never seen anybody who's trusted Jesus Christ in any situation for Christ not to bring them through it. And yeah, it doesn't always go the way we want or ask, but Christ is right there given incredible power and peace. Let's read on. We're almost done. Verse 37, <clears throat> and he allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue. And Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. 
And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Now, I like to always say Jesus always ruins a good funeral. (laughs) And here they are, and they've got their funeral. And and we see these stories of Jesus dealing with funerals. It's like he's frustrated with the whole funeral thing going on. You got to understand, in these ancient times, they would literally hire people to come and mourn and wail at your funeral. So these are paid people that have come, and they're wailing out loud. They're blowing trumpets, playing that tap song, and just, it's all sad, it's all gloomy, and it's real loud. And they do it in some cultures in our world today. And what it does is it takes the focus off the grieving family and just causes all this chaos. Jesus seemed to be frustrated with that. Stop all that. She's not dead. She's sleeping. Now, we already know she's dead. So why is Jesus saying she's not dead? She's sleeping. Because from his perspective, his children, even those who died, their body is just sleeping. Their soul is with him. That's why when you read the New Testament, you know what it refers to death as? Sleep. Sleep. You're just asleep. When you go to your loved one's funeral, Christian, and they're a believer in Christ, they're just asleep. Actually, the real person is in the presence of God, but the body's asleep. But one day, God's going to wake that body up that you love, that you held. And this is what he's showing here. This is what he's showing his power. So she was dead, but Jesus says it's just like she's sleeping because I'm going to wake her up. Because I'm the resurrection and the life, and I have power over death. Remember when he went to heal Lazarus? He told the disciples, "Uh, Lazarus is asleep, and I'm going to wake him. The disciple boneheads are like, well, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Let him sleep. Jesus like, he's dead. And for your sake, and then he says, for your sake, I'm glad. Who tells people you're glad that people died? Jesus. Because he loves to show us that he has power over death and we don't have to be afraid. That our loved one is just asleep. And one day we'll see him again. An amazing thing about this, I love the character of Jesus, the beauty of Jesus. Why does he only take, you know, he only takes Peter, James, and John. Is he showing favoritism? What about the other poor disciples? These were leaders. God does what he does. He chooses people for specific things. He took the leaders of the 12 with him. He didn't want to bring a big crowd of people in there where the little girl was lying dead. The mother and father came in. You know, why wouldn't Jesus, these, they, they laughed at him. You know, if it were me, you're laughing, come on in here, I'll show you. Jesus is not like that. He has no pride. He doesn't have anything to prove. And it's so simple for him. And so he says, those who laugh, you stay out. And by the way, this is the way it works with God. The people that want to laugh at God, the people who want to ignore God, the people who don't want God, they never see God. They never see God work. It's only the people that want to see. It's only the people that trust. It's only the people that have faith. And that's why he did all that. And we come to the great ending of the story. Verse 41. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. Now, Mark records what Jesus said in Aramaic. You know you got people in our world that think that's some kind of magical sentence to Letha Kumi. Mark tells you what it means. Little girl, I say to you, arise. That's all it means. In Aramaic, it means little lamb, rise. 
the great shepherd was saying, little lamb, wake up from the, wake up from the dead. Just so simple for him. Mark's just recording, this is how easy. Jesus said what her mother said to her. There was no magic. There was no loud hocus pocus. What a mother would say to a child when she's got to get ready for school. Little girl, little lamb, wake up. I say to you, arise. Verse 42, and immediately the girl got up and began walking for she was 12 years of age. It's a 12-year-old girl starting her whole life. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. She got up. You know, she embraced her parents and her parents embraced her. And Jairus, who risked everything, Jairus, who I'm sure was tempted not to believe, kept on believing. And Jesus Christ delivered. And the, power, the story is he will deliver for you as well. And then this is kind of confusing. Verse 43. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this. And he told them to give her something to eat. Last week, he casts out the man that has all the demons. And he tells this man, hey, go back to your town and tell everybody the mercy God has had upon you. Be a witness. But in this case, and isn't this why Jesus is doing this stuff? So people will see who he is? Don't tell anyone. Why? The main reason why? He was protecting Jairus. He was protecting Jairus' daughter. Do you know that the religious leaders of the day when Lazarus, we know for sure that they wanted to kill Lazarus after Jesus raised him from the dead? Instead of believing in Christ after seeing a resurrection, hey, let's get rid of Lazarus. Because every time Lazarus walks around, people know Christ is the truth, the way, the truth, the life. I believe Jesus was protecting this family. Don't tell anyone. Just enjoy what God has done in your home because you've trusted him. And that's why I believe that is. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. Now, I just want to say this in closing. We've got a baptism coming up. We're going to close this out and worship the Lord. Sometimes when we read this story, those of you at Freedom, you hear me say this all the time. Please don't get tired of it because it's important for people to hear this. You could be here, you could be in despair. You could be in despair because you lost somebody you love. And so then you think, how does this story help me? I lost my loved one. They died. They're not here. And I am brokenhearted. How can Jesus help me now? But he's really not raising the dead today. You need to understand that these stories are here because they're previews of coming attractions. Jesus is showing us what he can do. And it's still, it, it's what, what he still wants us to do is do not be afraid, only believe. Because we will see our loved ones again. Remember, the, the family in this story that he loved, the woman that he healed, they all grew old or got sick and died again. But because of their faith in Jesus, they're now in heaven and they're gonna live forever in new glorified bodies that will never face sickness and death again. So do you understand? The first time Jesus came, he deals with the sin on the in inside and he deals with our location after we die, heaven or hell. That's what he dealt with the first time. The next time he comes, he'll deal with resurrected bodies where there'll be no more sickness, disease, blindness, anything. But for now, it's where are you going to be located when you die? I heard the story of a uh, flower arrangement that got mixed up. One flower arrangement was going to a man that was starting a new business. The other flower arrangement was going to a man who had just died, and they got mixed up. So when the, the man who started the new business opened up his flowers and opened up his card, it said, 
I'm sorry for your loss. And he was like, man, I thought I was doing something good here in my new business. You think I'm losing, you know? So that, that kind of distracted him a little. But the next card was interesting that went to the man that died because when the family opened up that card, it said, good luck in your new location. <laughs> Folks, when you die... Location is everything. Location is everything. Okay? That's why this story is in here. That you make sure you put your one, the one that died for your sin, you come to him desperate, you bow your heart before him, you tell him of your need, you bring him into your life. He will save you from that. And in the future, he will raise you from the grave. Don't be afraid, just believe. In whatever situation you're in today, don't be afraid. Only believe. Let's bow and pray together. As we bow before the Lord, and I really don't believe you have to be on your knees. Sometimes I like to pray on my knees just to humble myself before God. But you don't have to because prayer comes from your heart. When I gave my heart to Christ, you know, Jeremy shared with us when he gave his heart to Christ, he walked down an aisle of a church and he prayed with him and he put his faith in Christ. When I got saved, I was sitting in the back seat, way in the back, bowing my head, sitting there in the chair, holding my head. But I trusted Christ that day and he came into my life. It's all about your heart. It's not about walking an aisle or raising your hand in the back like I did. It's simply about you going to God, being desperate for him, and coming to him personally and say to him, Jesus, I am a sinner. I've sinned against you. I am unclean. I don't deserve your mercy. I don't deserve your grace. I don't deserve to go to heaven. But I ask you to save me. I trust that you are my Savior. I want it to be personal. I want you to be my friend. And I want to know that when my life is in the midst of despair and when I get desperate, I can come to you and I can find hope. I can find hope. Really, I believe the true test of somebody who wants Christ, somebody who's truly put their faith in Christ, how do we know that? Well, God gave us an outward sign, baptism. And we're going to see one man today get baptized who I believe truly has put his faith in Christ. And we're going to see a testimony of that this morning. I pray that is what you'll do. I pray that you'll trust in Christ in your heart. You'll be obedient to him in baptism. And you will follow him the rest of your life. When you get afraid, you'll keep on believing. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this powerful story. God, just reading it is powerful. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that helps us to understand it. Thank you for reaching into our hearts and opening our eyes so we can see the truth. Thank you for the seeds of the gospel that we've been studying are so powerful. And if we have a heart to embrace it, that seed will explode and grow. And God, you'll become more real to us than ever before. Lord, I pray for the person that's in despair. I pray for someone who came in here desperate. Lord, I pray they, they came to the right place today. I pray that somehow they understand this. I pray somehow they reach out for you to help. Lord, I pray that you'd reach down and intervene in their situation and fill them with this promised hope that you give. Help us all together to pray for one another and love one another. And when life does get hard and when there is loss and pain and sickness, 
that we continue to trust you. And one day soon, Lord, you're coming. And it's sooner than we think. Help us to stay ready. Help us to bring others, Lord. Help us to tell others about your beautiful grace and gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to worship. I pray that you worship with all of your heart like you truly know him, you truly love him. And then we'll close the service with a baptism. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed away, I owe all to you. I owe. Where?
you guys have a seat. This is my good buddy Richard Lockhart comes today to testify to you that he's put his faith in Jesus Christ and be obedient uh, to the Lord in baptism. I always like to explain baptism so you don't get confused. Um, Baptism does not save you. There's nothing magic about this water. There's nothing magic about my hands baptizing Richard, okay? It's, it's just a picture that Richard has put his faith in Jesus Christ. So Christ is already in him before the baptism. The baptism just shows proof that he's serious about it, okay? And baptism's a picture. When he goes under the water, it's a picture of the old Richard's gone, his sins are forgiven, His old life, past past mistakes, whatever, they're gone, thrown into the depths of the sea. And he comes up. It's a picture that he's a brand new person. You know, in creation, I think God, it's like the caterpillar, and now he's a butterfly in his heart through Jesus Christ. It also identifies you with Christ because Christ died, was buried, and he rose again. Therefore, we will do that again. Richard is... uh, 85 years old. (laughs) Praise God. You know, the statistics are very few people come to Christ in their old age. Very few because they're kind of just so set in their ways. Sometimes that's why it's important to have children's church and and young people and youth group because that's when sometimes people get a hold of their hearts. Here's an 85-year-old man. He's a Korean vet. Thank God for his service. A soldier. (laughs) So a couple lessons from this. His son, Paul, has been praying for his dad to come to Christ for 28 years. 28 years. And, you know, I think in Richard, like a lot of people, I think he's, he's a soldier. He's a good man. You know, he went to church a lot of years of his life. But he never made it personal. And he came to freedom. He heard the word of God. The word of God has become alive to him. He understands it more than ever. And I was at his house and kind of explained the gospel to him. And I allowed his son Paul, who had been praying for him, to lead him in a prayer to receive Christ as his Savior. He's a new man. He's happy. He brought all his family here to see him today. It's a great testimony. Don't ever give up praying for your loved ones. Don't ever give up praying for your loved ones. God is still doing miracles in hearts today. That's the greatest miracle. So, Richard, thank you for your service. Thank you for your humility to get up here and testify. Thank you that you've responded and you know of your need of Jesus as your Savior. And thank you for being a witness to all these people. I'll bet there's somebody out here because of you. They're going to sign up for the next baptism because of your boldness and courage, and they'll, they're going to follow you as a brother in Christ. So it's my privilege as your pastor, Richard, to baptize you now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ, raised to walk a new life with him. Take <laughs> So it's warm water. Better get better than getting baptized in Lake Michigan, right? Or something like that? Yeah. Good deal. Thank you, brother. You can go ahead. These guys will help you get out. Love ending the service on baptism, really do. It's just a beautiful picture 
of Jesus Christ's work. If you've never been baptized, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. If you've truly trusted Christ, come and be obedient. Glorify God. It, it, it doesn't save you, but it's a pledge of good conscience that you are going to follow him. Uh, men have started a Monday night Bible study at 630. It just got started last week. They've got plenty of books. If you're looking to grow even more men, uh, you need that. Get out there with those men on Monday night. Wednesday night, we've been having church. Pretty simple, just Bible study, prayer. You can bring your kids. They'll, they'll watch your kids for you. Come on Wednesday night. Uh, in two weeks, I believe it's the 29th of September, we're going to do a church cleanup out there at the property. So if that's something you're gifted at, if you can come help fix things, clean things, we're going to clean inside and out. I think it'll be from 8 a.m. to 12. Try to get it done before the heat. Okay. Uh, believe it or not, you, some of you don't know. I mean, we, we own that property out there, and we do a lot of Bible study, a lot of stuff out there. And we, we want to, uh, it's, it's God's property. Whatever is God's, we want to take care of. So if, you, if that's a way you can help, be a part of that. That's it. Let's pray. Let's pray. Thank God for the service. Let's go watch some football. <laughs> <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you that we can come here. Thank you that we can laugh. Thank you that we, you've given us personalities that love one another and can laugh together and share together. Lord, sin has damaged that. It, it, it has damaged relationships. It damages marriage, families. But thank you, Lord Jesus, that when you come into our life, you can reverse the curse. You can put families, marriages, relationships back together. Thank you that we see this all the time. We're sorry that those that laugh at you, those that want you, they don't see it. But God, we pray you'd have mercy on them, and we pray that we would go out and share with them and love them. And continue to spread the good news before you return again. I pray that we would go out now rejoicing in our Savior, our God, and our friend. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See you all next time. <laughs>